One afternoon, while walking in Old Road in Clacton, in the opposite direction came a vision that was to have a fundamental impact on my life. As the slim figure drew near, with long hair and a purple knitted beret on one side, one foot on the pavement and one on the road as he walked, as if to defy any hint of conformity, he stopped right in front of me, lifted his head and said, Hello, B. Despite us being strangers, I knew this was a man that needed further investigation. His name was Sean Donovan. Sean looked almost exactly like the keyboard player Vincent Crane. He smelled strongly of patchouli oil, was dressed in what hardened bikers termed originals, unwashed and heavily patched jeans, monkey boots and a knitted sweater that hung to his knees. This creature was like nothing I'd ever seen before. We walked together, and over many months became very close friends. Sean introduced me to the most amazing music, and we frequently laughed at the same things. I came to adore this man, and although I have not seen him in many years, I still regard him as the most wonderful friend I ever had, as well as broadening my outlook on life. He would turn up many times in my life, until I eventually returned to Coventry, but I can think of no one that had such a huge impact on my life as Sean. If I had moments in my life when things became too much, I could turn up on his doorstep without explanation, and I was always invited in, and could stay as long as I needed. He once rented the attic of a former barn in a place called Copford, there was a tiny window at one end, and when I looked down outside, I saw a huge pile of alarm clocks. I asked him what they were doing there. Oh, B, he said. They're all the ones that let me down and made me late for work. I just threw them out. Sean had weaknesses, though. He and alcohol did not mix at all. Beer made him angry and unpredictable, and this couple with his hatred for authority could land him in deep water. It could be terrifying to most. However, I had a calming influence and love for him, and even if he was in the midst of a violent exchange with someone, I could simply wander in, whisper in his ear, and he would follow me like a lamb. Such was the trust and bond between us. One particular memory I have is making a patch, which was simply a denim jacket with the arms removed, slid over a leather biker's jacket. Not wishing to have a plain one, and feeling partly connected with the biker's world in Clacton, if only on nodding terms, I drew a pair of crossed hands on the back with the words Gambit beneath. The New Avengers with Gareth Hunter's Gambit was popular at the time. I mentioned to Sean that I was considering going down to the local greasy bikers pub, the Medina, on the Friday night, which oddly was right next to the police station. The local biker chapter was known as the Filthy Few. Sean looked worried. Listen, if you go in there with that on, you like to get your head caved in, he said. It's noteworthy that bikers with connections to the Hells Angels wear their patches with pride like uniforms, and are notoriously protective of them. Moreover, to get into such local groups usually requires some hideous initiation ceremony, such as having to strangle a sparrow. Ah, who cares, it'll be fun. They're not that tough, I replied. I did go in on the Friday night, and not a word was said, but the gambit thing amused Sean all night. He would often recall it and chuckle. Despite being well known in biker groups, I generally kept myself tidy and with shorter hair. I was well aware that to many women greasy bikers were simply gross, and besides it meant I could fit in absolutely anywhere with only minor changes in dress. This chameleon approach has worked well over the years. Sean constantly nagged me about my short locks and tried to get me to grow it. I insisted it would look terrible on me, but agreed to let it grow for a year. When we met up again, he took one look and said, You're right, it doesn't suit you. I said nothing, and the next day it was short again. 